everyone. For those who don't know me, most of you do. I'm Marsha Brondi, and I'm a member here. And uh, well, I'm about to become a member then. <laughs> we, we are having a um, membership weekend on the 21st and 22nd of October, and everybody is welcome to come and participate. There's a workshop on Saturday, a potluck on Saturday night, and a service on Sunday when we will um, all stand up and say, hi, I want to be a member. <laughs> and um, so, I'd like to welcome you to the morning service, and I need a copy of the uh, program. <laughs> Where did it go? Oh, wonderful, thank you. Um, I took on this, <laughs> this project um, foolishly, um, because I really didn't give myself enough time to prepare this absolutely amazing subject. And it's only when you begin to dig in to the history of uh, women in the Unitarian Church who have, and Unitarian and Universalist Church, which joined at some point, um, that you begin to understand the depth and breadth of the um, quality of people who are participating in this. And you'll hear more about that later on. But I'm, um, we'll begin by lighting the chalice. And because I am a Luddite. <laughs> when it comes to candles, and I certainly prefer now I will say, as information for all of us, that we have been uh, called to task by the seniors who called to complain about wax on the floor. Oh, no. And when everybody stands with their candle and they're talking and <laughs> dripping on the floor, it's really not good. So. Oh, Bo is gone. Bo went out and um, and bought us a dripless candle. But that even so doesn't mean you should stand like that with the candle. But um, so here we are. And with that message to everybody, I'd like to bring um, the light into the room. Um, uh, the light of history, the light of love, uh, the light of our Unitarian principles and give us a chance to exercise those in the coming hours and, and days. And thus the chalice is lighted. Um, now we have a practice here after we've lit the chalice, to invite people who have um, things on their mind about concerns, they're worried about people or things that are happening and they want to say them out loud, or they want to celebrate something, a joy that's happened in their lives. Thank you. Uh, I would like to light a candle today for Marcia because um, even though she's been very, very busy <laughs> and uh, today um, uh, she told me she has a cold in spite of everything she's here and thank you Marcia. And also, I'd like to light a candle for my friend who um, is still in the hospital after an accident. And uh, I'd uh, light a candle that she will be well and uh, back, back uh, with 
Celebrations and concerns. And I'm letting this candle for uh, my stepdaughter Kimberly and her family. I think everybody can hear me. And um, they recently went through um, a bit of a, a tragedy. They uh, lost their baby. Uh, it was a stillborn last week. And um, so it was a really hard time. But they're working through their grief. And so this candle is for Wilder, Kimberly, Andrew, Paisley. Garrett and of course Michael. Michael has been with them and uh, her mom. And uh, this is, and the baby's name is Wilder. And they, it was a term. It was full term, yeah. And the baby's heart stopped beating about eight hours before delivery. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. I'd like to light a candle today. Um, this is for um, my two daughters and one, two, three grandchildren and one uh, grandson-in-law. <laughs> three granddaughters and one grandson-in-law who at this moment are flying to Peru. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're going on a grand trip, two weeks. They're going to see uh, Machu Picchu and they're going to take a cruise up oh. the Amazon and oh. things like that. So here you are. <laughs> Good luck and much blessing for your trip. Thank you. Well, I'd like to light this candle for all the lovely women in this world. I've been reading a book called Sapiens by Harari, and he pointed out again that from the Code of Hammurabi uh, all through the rest of the history of Homo sapiens, women have been the most discriminating class of people in our uh, Homo sapien history, and I'm glad that, that you're going to be talking and addressing that. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Hello, mm -hmm. my name is Karen, and I'm lighting this candle for my sister Phyllis, who survived the hurricane on the Gulf Coast. Oh, it's me. Mm. Well, I'd like to um, light a candle for um, everybody who's, who's just been so impacted um, by these natural disasters and um, was specifically really feeling um, the people in their distress in Puerto Rico today and, um, and also just shining a light on um, the earthquakes that happened in Mexico that were so devastating for, for families. So, but really for people everywhere that are just natural disasters being so impacted. So may they find shelter and care and protection as much as possible. And this is from my favorite Marsh, Marsha. <laughs> I was supposed to read this in the beginning. No, no, you're supposed to read that to introduce me. I know. Before I do my sermon. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, this is 
my favorite Marsha. <laughs> it's a pleasure to work together on this. Thanks, Gail. <clears throat> and I will light this candle for all of the unspoken or not ready to come out to the light of day joys and concerns that are extant here and in the world. Now, now we have a very special treat. Um, I will bring this no, no, just microphone over to okay. you, to the two of you. And I'd like to introduce to the group Ava Tree and her daughter, um, Ayana. And when we were talking, and I was saying, talking about all the wonderful women, you know, Unitarians that I had been discovering and knew about in history, Beatrix Potter is one of those. Uh, the woman who wrote Peter Rabbit and many, many other stories. And um, Ava said, well, my daughter's just spent two or three weeks studying that. And, and, <laughs> and I said, perhaps she would like to read a piece from Peter Rabbit. And I'd like to hand the floor over. So, should we share? So this, Ayana did this. Um, turn it on. Oh, yes. You want to show your picture first? So Ayana is, um, uh, it's such a joy to watch Ayana create her gorgeous art. And, and um, this, this is her picture of Peter Rabbit. You can see the little bunny rabbit ears of the other rabbits. And, Looks like, is that in uh, Mr. McGregor's garden, honey? Yeah. Okay. Maybe you could pass it around the circle. Okay. Okay, so Ayana's going to read A Tale of Peter Rabbit, and I think I'm going to um, help her out a little bit. You're going to start. Okay. A Tale of Peter Rabbit. Once upon a time, there were four little rabbits, and their names were Flopsy, Mopsy, and Cottontail. And most importantly, Peter. Mm -hmm. They lived with their mother in a sandbank underneath the root of a very big fir tree. Now, my dears, said old Miss Rabbit one morning, you may go into the fields or down the lane, but don't get go into Mr. McGregor's garden, for your father had an accident there. He was put into a pie by Mrs. McGregor. <laughs> Now run along and don't get into mischief. I am going out. Then old Mrs. Rabbit took her basket and her umbrella and went through the woods to the baker's. She bought a loaf of brown bread and five currant buns. Flopsy gathered blackberries, but Peter, who was very naughty, ran straight away to Mr. McGregor's garden and squeezed under the gate. Oh my. First, he ate some lettuces and some French beans, and then he ate some radishes. And then, feeling rather sick, went looking for some parsley. But round the end of a cucumber frame, whom should he meet but Mr. McGregor? Mr. McGregor, on his hands and knees, planting young cabbages, but he jumped up and ran after Peter, waving a rake and calling, Stop, feet! Peter was most dreadfully frightened. He rushed all over the garden, for he had forgotten the way back to the gate. He lost one of his shoes among the cabbages and the other shoe amongst the potatoes. After losing them, he ran on four legs, and he went faster, so I think he might have gotten away altogether if he hadn't got, if he hadn't ran into a gooseberry net and got caught by the large buttons on his jacket. 
It was a blue jacket with brass buttons, quite new. <laughs> Peter gave himself up for lost, and he shed big tears. But his sobs were overheard by friendly sparrows, who flew to him in great excitement and implored him to exert himself. Mr. McGregor came up with a, a sieve with which he intended to pop on top of Peter, but Peter wriggled out just in time, leaving his jacket behind him. And he rushed into the tool shed and he jumped into a can. It would have been a beautiful thing to hide in if it had not had so much water in it. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. McGregor was quite sure that Peter somewhere was somewhere in the tool shed, perhaps hidden underneath a flower pot. He began turning them over carefully, looking under each. Presently, Peter sneezed. Ka-choo! <laughs> Mr. McGregor was after him in no time and he tried to put his foot upon Peter, who jumped out of a window, upsetting three plants. The window was too small for Mr. McGregor, and he was tired of running after Peter, so he went back to work. Should we pause there? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We're almost at the chamomile tea. <laughs> but anyway. You want some, oh, play no, the no, chamomile? That's part, of, that's part of the story. Because oh. when he gets so frightened, and then he finally makes it home, and his mama makes him some chamomile tea. Lovely. So, so tune in next week. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's, a story. it's a great story. I see why you enjoy reading. <laughs> and, as usual, there are wonderful lessons in the story. There. Obey your mother. Hmm? <laughs> Obey your mother. <laughs> yeah. That's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> Especially if it keeps you safe and out of a pie. Right? <laughs> You're a rabbit naked might be better. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and I, I didn't bring the book, so I'm going to have that story and the wonderful lessons in it be the beginning of our one minute or two of meditation. A little bit of quiet time. So... Dr. Marcia Brandi, 
is a multidisciplinary academic feminist who keeps her hand in as a Red Seal construction carpenter, a multimedia project manager, an educator, an author, an archivist, an independent scholar, and a social change activist. And uh, she does a pretty good job of cooking fish, too. <laughs> Find her bio at, do I have to read this? Okay, I can, I, you'll never remember it anyway. It's a website that's a mile long. Public, I'll tell you after. Publications at another website and education and advocacy at www.menwomentools.ca. In fact, I think there's a link in the back of your service. Yes. There's, there's a lot to find on that. She works with men and women, often separately, to bring about effective integration for women in trades and technology, training, and work. And here I am. <laughs> just a human being after all. Yeah, just a human being. Um, okay, as you see, I have a great deal of paper to look at in the next half hour, 20 minutes, whatever. But um, I think I have another sort of shorter version over here. Um, in looking at the history of women in the Unitarian Church, we, I, I've tried to sort of separate it up a little bit by centuries and what was happening in each of those centuries. So in the 1700s, we had two women who were quite amazing, one right after the other. And while Mary Wollstonecraft, we've some of you may have heard of her. Um, she wrote a vindication of the rights of women in, uh, 19, in 1797. But what I discovered is that prior to her doing that work, she was building on a woman named Judith Mar Sergeant Murray. And I'm going to pass this piece of paper around because it has a photograph of, um, of Judith Sergeant Murray. Uh, she was the first woman born in the United States to have her plays performed professionally. She wrote numerous poems and essays, and um, illustrating on religion, politics, education, and the manners and customs of the day, illustrating her views through fictional stories. Uh, she wrote one of the earliest published statements on women's rights on the equality of the sexes, and it was first published in 1790, seven years before uh, Wollstonecraft published hers, but it was actually written in 1770. Um, and she published it in two parts, in two separate issues of Massachusetts Magazine. You know, I don't know what was going on in the Northeastern United States at the time. Well, of course, we do know they were having a revolution. <laughs> <laughs> But um, not from the seven, late 1700s through uh, the 1800s, the, the transcend, transcendentalist movement was there. They were, they were sort of Unitarians and others who wanted to take it further because um, in, the, in the early days of, of Unitarianism, they were very Christian-based. It, it, it grew out of a rejection of the Trinity. Um, so that's why you have a Unitarian, right? There, there's not three parts to God, there's one God, and that's what they thought. But during that period, um, many people, the Transcendentalists particularly, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was a Unitarian minister, uh, had a cohort around him in Concord, Massachusetts, where um, all the thinkers of the day used to hang out and, and chat. And some of the women that we're going to talk about um, grew up at the feet of those folks and uh, used, used those ideas in putting forward their own arguments for a better life for people. Um, so, there we have uh, Judith Sargent Murray, 
and, and her thoughts, and, and also Wollstonecraft's thoughts, really talk about in order to have real equality for women, we needed to educate them the same way that we were educating the boys. And education became a primary focus for much of those two centuries. We need to stop just educating girls in you know, how to make lace and embroidery. <laughs> and, and really, uh, they should be learning the classics, they should be learning to think. Um, and if that was the case, if they had those opportunities, the world would be a better place. And I think that we have reached a point where many women in the world are having those opportunities. We also know that many women in the world are not. And today, while she's not a Unitarian, we have people like Malala Yousef, who um, are fighting that struggle in many places in the world today. And then we have people like the Grands to Grands and the Stephen Lewis Foundation who are fighting that fight as well and uh, helping, helping the uh, African grandmothers to educate their children. Um, and so, but, but this is where it started, right? This is, this is where uh, there was a very deep commitment that we needed to change that situation. Walston's work argued that the educational system of her time deliber deliberately trained women to be frivolous and incapable. <laughs> she posited that an educational system that allowed girls the same advantages as boys would result in women who would not only be exceptional wives and mothers, but also capable workers in many professions. And we'll get on to the professions a little bit later in the talk because women weren't allowed in all of those professions. <laughs> and, and it took many, many women making a, a big effort. Um, and the difference between Wollstonecraft's argument and Julie Sargent uh, Murray's argument is that Wollstonecraft said, we need uh, political, radical reform. We need a political change and radical reform of the national education system. And it was the activism in Wollstonecraft. But you know, it's like change takes time. So I'm just going to pass these on so you can take, take a look at what they look like. <laughs> um, and we go on uh, to the 1800s. Um, there was a woman, Augusta Jane Chapin who was a universalist minister and educator. Now there was, I don't want to lose this because I came across the woman who was the first woman to be, um, what do they, what word do they use? Um, uh, just a second. I, I, you have to bear with me. Um, What's, what is the word that they use when they induct a, a person into the ministry? Ordained. Ordained. Thank you very much. Uh, the first woman who was ordained um, was quite, quite a lovely person, but it, it took to like sort of towards the end of the um, 1800s before we actually saw that happen. Um, there's Fanny. Um, and, and we're, ah, oh, there she is. <laughs> Olympia Brown. Olympia was one of the first women ministers whose ordination was recognized by any religious denomination. Uh, she lived from 1835 to 1926, so it took a really long time for that. <coughs> and, Beatrix Potter was actually um, uh, in that period of time as well. And, um, and she, Beatrix wrote about 30 books. 
And uh, do you want to tell us anything about Beatrix Potter? Well, I know that um, she wasn't allowed to go off of her property because her mom was a bit overprotective. And she named all of her book characters off of her own animals that she kind of kept named and uh -huh. um, for those with fun, friends that she was involved in. And I think it's true that she, when she first tried to write her stories and she, uh, she tried to get them published, they weren't going to publish them, them um, right? She, she went to 10 different people. So she did not give up. That's pretty powerful for, because that was pretty unheard of, I think, for a young woman to get published. So 10 different publishers. Do you know how old she was when she first published? In her 30s. Was she in her 30s? Okay. She was in her 30s, wow. but she started writing at a much, much younger age than that. Um, the things I found out about her that I found quite fascinating, um, she was a, an illustrator, a natural scientist, and a conservationist. Mm. And what she did, the moment that she came into some money from an aunt, not a great deal of money, uh, at the age of 47, she married, and she received um, this small legacy from her aunt, and she bought Hilltop Farm mm -hmm. uh, in the Lakes District. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, the, and, and at that farm, she started raising sheep. And, and through the course of selling her books, which were I think they, it said something about uh, there were 50,000 copies of Peter Rabbit sold uh, <laughs> at that time. Very hard. Very hard. Yes. Um, and, and by the t age of 77, uh, she died and, um, almost all of, and she left almost all of her property to the National Trust. Because during that period of time, she was buying up all the farms around where she was. And they were raising um, uh, a herdwick sheep. And so the trust now owns 91 hill farms, uh, many of which had mainly Hedgewick landlords flock with a total housing of about 25,000 sheep. This was her gift to the nation, her own beloved countryside for all to enjoy. She was the first woman to be elected to the um, Herdwick Sheep Breeders Association. <laughs> <laughs> so she has a lot of very interesting capacities. And, and it's only because she was a writer and she started expressing herself and her ideas and she got acknowledged and fostered in that. So I think that's pretty wonderful. You can visit the, today. At, yeah, the farms. At the farm, yeah. At the National yeah. Trust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pretty wonderful. Um, so, now we go on. So, the other thing that was happening in the, in the uh, 1800s, we've moved on from the 1700s, these people were in the 1800s, we've just been discussing, was the issue of women's equality and women's suffrage. Uh, and also women's health. Um, we have Clara Barton, who is a, a Unitarian, uh, and she was a pioneering nurse. Uh, even to become a nurse was not that easy, but um, she founded the American Red Cross. And you think about women who had no uh, permission to be a, alive in the public world, to have overcome all of those kinds of barriers, to have reached a point where she founded the American Red Cross. Um, and there's a woman, Augusta Jane Chapin, uh, who was born in 1836 and died in 1905. She was a universalist minister and educator, one of the earliest as well to be ordained in ministry. Um, she was the first woman to sit on the Council of the General Convention of Universalists. So they were letting, they began to let them in. <laughs> she was also a groundbreaker for women seeking higher education and advanced degrees because 
for the most part, you weren't even allowed to go to school. And uh, I have several women who, who uh, wanted to go to Harvard, and it took many, many, many years of struggle. And, but they were, at some points, assisted by, by some individual men who agreed with their cause. And that was really important. Um, I've actually forgotten one person that I really wanted to talk about. Um, in the 1700s, while she was she was still alive in the 1800s, she died in 1818. But her name was Abigail Adams. Mm -hmm. Abigail Adams was a Unitarian, but she was also the wife of John Adams, the second president of the United States of America. And they they laugh and they they talk about her being um, she's she was designated as the first. Uh, second lady, which is the wife of, and then she was the first lady of, of the United States. Um, so she, her husband, totally loved and respected her <coughs> and honored all of her ideas, which she brought very clearly, and you know, they, they discussed all of that. When I was about, how old are you, Bianca? You're nine. Well, when I was eight or nine, I was an avid reader, and my mother gave me a book on Abigail Adams. Mm -hmm. And I was thrilled. I, I just thought, here's this woman um, who is grounded as, as a real and wonderful person, um, but being sought for her, you know, for her advice. Um, and they, John and Abigail, he was often uh, off in Washington, and they, they exchanged letters in which a great deal of political discussion took place. And those letters, of course, were kept. Um, and, and her letters also serve as an eyewitness account of the American Revolutionary War. Um, and she advocated and modeled an expanded role for women in public affairs during the formative days of the United States. Um, she left voluminous correspondence providing information on everyday life and insight into the activities of the corridors of power during her time. Her, they show her to have been a woman of keen intelligence, resourceful, competent, self-sufficient, willful, mm. <laughs> vivacious and opinionated, a formidable force. Um, her writing reveals a dedication to principle a commitment to rights for women and for African Americans. Fierce partisanship in the matters of her husband, etc. But that brings me to the, the other major um, area of uh, commitment um, in the 1800s. We have um, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Who, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, we're not sure whether she was a Unitarian or not, but Susan B. Anthea did sign the membership book. <coughs> and they, through their work, um, in 1878, um, oh, give me that one thing, um, arranged for, and again, because it was Congress and there were no women in Congress, <laughs> They did arrange for uh, a man who was supportive of the initiative to uh, present an amendment to, con to Congress giving women the right to vote. Now, sadly, um, it, was known, it was known as the Anthony Amendment, and it was introduced by Senator Aaron A. Sargent, who was a Republican of California. It became the 19th Amendment to the US Constitution, but not until six years after uh, Susan B. Anthony died. But, you know, doesn't matter. The work was, was done and it kept being done and the 19th Amendment gave women the right to vote. And so this, these are really important things that happened during that period of time. And frankly, they had, uh, I guess in 1848, they had the Seneca Convention on uh, the Rights of Women in, in New York State, which these women were very active in. But the other person who was very active there is a woman named Emily Howard Jennings Stowe, who's a Canadian. 
and she's a path-breaking Canadian woman physician and suffragist. She led campaigns to provide women access to medical schools and other professional education. Her efforts led to the organization of the Women's Movement in Canada and to the foundation of a medical college for women. You know, these are, these are women who've changed the world, and I honor them. And I'm very glad to be here talking about them. Um, and, and, and so there was another quite interesting person who I had never heard of in my research that I found, a woman named Hannah Adams. And she's an early American historian and a pioneer in the field of comparative religion. She was uh, the first author, American author, to make a living solely from writing. Uh, she was the first historian of religions ever to try to represent sects and denominations in terms of which adherents themselves used in, from their own perspectives. So the notion of comparative religion um, is fodder for those people who gathered in the 1800s to say um, Christianity, a specific, rigid, tiny view, is not the only way to look at religion. There are so many ways in which people express their spirituality that we can, um, we need to be able to acknowledge that and give a greater space in our own minds and hearts to the way, the different ways that people express their spirituality. And so we have Hannah to thank for that. Um, and so let's see. She published an, alphabet, an alphabetical compendium of the various sects which have appeared from the beginning of the Christian era to the present era. <laughs> and it was widely distributed, and there were um, many demands for that dictionary, uh, and there were also many people who rejected and complained about the fact that it existed. Um, of particular note are her lengthening descriptions of the emerging Unitarians, which drew heavily on the ideas of English Unitarian theologian Joseph Priestley, who's considered to be one of the sort of founders of uh, activist Unitarian thought. So we're done here <laughs> with that one. Um, now, it's interesting what they say about her. Uh, you know, she became a dinner party uh, star, and everybody loved to have her around. Uh, she's, she even enjoyed a two-week stay at the home of her distant cousin, John Adams. Miss Adams fulfilled her professional ambitions, but did not challenge the customs which barred women from attending or teaching at Harvard or any other New England university. She succeeded rather through personal relations with the affluent. It's, it's, it's important to remember that none of these people are perfect. And, <laughs> and, they, and, and, and sometimes they, they you, you want them to have gone further. <laughs> and it would happen sooner, but we don't have that capacity, so we're just still working on all of it. Um, okay, we're done with them. Then we get to Frances Watkins Harper. Um, a black woman who was a prolific writer, lecturer, and reformer who wrote many books of poetry with strong anti-slavery themes, as well as a novel about African-American life during Reconstruction. So if we didn't have those kinds of stories, we wouldn't really know what the history is or was. Um, and, and she was a, a writer for the African Methodist Episcopal Church and a member of the Unitarian Church. Watkins once refused to give up her seat on a Philadelphia streetcar. When the conductor refused to take her money at the end of her ride, she threw it on the floor and left. And then um, we have Emily Stowe who I just mentioned before. 
and she was denied admission to the Toronto School of Medicine. The vice president of the University of Toronto told her, the doors of the university are not open to women, and I trust they never will be. <laughs> Stowe replied, then I will take, make it my, the business of my life to see that they will be opened, that women will have the same opportunities as men. Unable to get medical training anywhere in Canada, Stowe attended the New York Medical College for Women, 1865 to 67. She studied under Dr. Clarence Clements Lozier, a former teacher who had obtained the charter for her medical school with the aid of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. The names keep popping up, um, as we see here, and we'll see a similar kind of thing popping up around uh, Emerson's um, you know, little home in Concord, Massachusetts. Um, since New York's Bellevue Hospital welcomed the help of women medical stu students during the Civil War when all the men were gone, Stowe was allowed, despite male medical student displeasure, to participate in its clinics and learn dissection. Two of her sisters, Ella Jennings and Han Hannah Jennings Kimball, later attended the school. In the United States, Stowe met and learned from Susie B. Susan B. Anthony. A witness to the divisions within the American women's movement, Stowe adopted a patient strategy, encouraging gradual project progress when later advancing women's rights and suffrage in her own country, Canada. Um, she was disappointed that even with her degree, she still could not attain a medical license. Not until 1870 was she allowed to take the courses at the University of Toronto required of holders of foreign medical credentials and then only by special arrangement. She found the classroom behavior of a faculty member and some students towards her despicable. She did not get her license for years afterward as she refused to take the written and oral exams administered by the men of the Council of the College of Physicians and Surgeons. That didn't mean she didn't practice. Um, oh, I think this is an important piece. The most serious incident, incident of Stowe's medical career occurred in 1880. An investigation into the death of a pregnant woman revealed that she had taken medicine prescribed by Stowe. Implicit in the subsequent legal proceeding was an old suspicion that all women doctors were abortionists. The trial, however, cleared Stowe. Without her asking for it, later that year, she was finally granted a medical license on the grounds that counting her childhood homeopathic apprenticeship, she had been in medicine since before 1850. She observed, my career has been one of struggle, attended by that sort of persecution which falls to the lot of everyone who pioneers a new movement or steps out of line with established custom. And I really relate to that, <laughs> I have to say. In 1888, she attended an international conference of suffragists in Washington, D.C. Early the following year, to revitalize the Canadian women's movement, she invited the prominent American suffragist Anna, Anna Shower, Howard Shaw to come to Toronto to speak. Shaw contended that if women gained the vote, the whole community would benefit. In the enthusiasm aroused, the Dominion Women's Enfranchisement Association was founded and Stowe was elected the president. Isn't, I mean, it's just, it's just wonderful. Uh, and then, of course, we have the Women's Christian Temperance League, which so many of these people seem to, you know, get involved with. <laughs> but Stowe addressed the Ontario legislature asking for the vote for widows and spinsters. As educated citizens, as educated citizens, I have to stop, but I will say very quickly that Louisa May Alcott, the author of Little Women, was in fact a Unitarian. And Fanny Barbara Williams, who after moving to the South to teach, um, she was a black woman who moved down there to teach and working for the rights of African American women. She was one of the first leaders to identify housing segregation and limited employment opportunities as crucial issues for racial justice. And we all know that those issues have not been dealt with, even to today. Yeah. 
but people are still struggling. She struggled. She made some inroads. Um, and, and so now, instead of giving you all the goodies on everybody, I'm going to very quickly run forward and, um, and hit you need to do another program, no, part yeah, two. Maybe, maybe yeah, maybe part two. two. Yeah, I'm serious. serious. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I just need to mention Vlada Hishmanova. <laughs> um, in 1945, she helped to found the Unitarian Service Committee of Canada, an international development organization consisting of a small group of aid workers sending supplies to war-torn Europe for relief and reconstruction. And that attired in an army nurse's uniform and military-style hat, she traveled yearly to strife-torn and poverty-stricken parts of the world, searching out towns and villages in need of Canadian assistance to recover from drought, war, disease, and poverty. And that organization still exists today. And I just um, honor Lada Hishmanova, and I want to honor a woman named Viola Greg Luiso, and I'll pass her picture around. Um, she was a UU lay person and a mother of five children from Detroit who went to Selma to participate in the marches of 1965. While transporting marchers in her car, she was shot and killed by members of the Ku Klux Klan. Today she is remembered as a martyr for the civil rights movement. Okay, and Margaret Lawrence, of course. I'm not going to go into great detail. I'll wait Margaret for the Lawrence. next one. Margaret Lawrence was a Unitarian. Oh, wow. <laughs> there are so many names here of people who are Unitarians that it's really hard to uh, decide who to leave in and who to leave out. But I will end with two things. One, um, Margot Adler. Oh. <laughs> Margot Adler was, is, was, was a Unitarian. She died in 2014. Uh, she's a pagan Unitarian. <laughs> and she wrote uh, Drawing Down the Moon. Right. And, um, and was uh, quite, she came from a Jewish family and uh, you know, moved to Unitarian paganism. Uh, <coughs> paganism first and Unitarian after that. Um, and I have a lot to say about her, but I think I'm going to save that for the next one. Um, and, and then, just to end, I wanted to say, while we have these notable women and many others, there are also notable men. Pete Seeger, Rod Serling, Christopher Reeve, Sir Isaac Newton, Paul Newman, Robert Munch, Herman Melville, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. Neville Chamberlain, and a host of others. It has been my honor to um, have been doing this research and bringing these names back to the light of day. And so I thank you very much for listening. Okay, can we, can we open it up to anybody who might have anything to say? Responses? What do you think about all of that? That's fire. I think it's very, very lovely, and I look forward to that too. I do too. Yeah. And the men. I like to hear about the men as well because I know it's been, it's just fabulous. I, and knowing who they are and how it all connects, and even bringing forward today. Yeah. How you know it does make a difference. Yeah. But I have another oh, yes, appointment. Please. I have to run. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Okay. Um, other thoughts? Anybody want to say anything? How about you? Well, what about your mother? What about your mother? Before the before the vote for women? Well, go ahead. You no, go ahead. No, no. <laughs> I know. You know the story. What you want to say? Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, the the two. Yeah. She, she was born before she had the right to vote. 1912, yeah. In 1912. Well, your mother was born that time. Yeah, right. Many of us, yeah. What 
that was like. It was just, just so absurd, you know, that women were pro prohibited from all that. Yeah, and it was because people didn't think we could think. Yeah, that's right. Yes. A lot of like that. Well, I, the only, <coughs> one thing that's brought up for me was uh, an acquaintance, um, a friend it's of yours. Awesome. Oh, it's not. Should be. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, a friend, a friend of your brother's, who was brought up in the south, and uh, I remember she said something like she she wasn't a very good cook, she wasn't a very good housekeeper, she didn't do any of those things very well, because her mother had raised her to be a lady who was to be waited on. She didn't need to know any of those things, but, and, and so crippling. She was very crippling. Okay. Here she was. Here she, she was well, about her age. And, you know, I, I, she, I mean, she might be in her 60s, 70s, something like that. Anyway, but here she was. She really wasn't. She could. She could barely care for herself because of her training. And that was. And that's not that long ago. So. Uh, one of the people that I didn't didn't talk about was Margaret Sanger. All right. Uh, Margaret Sanger. Um, is the woman who brought birth control to the United States and Canada. <laughs> um, recognizing, I mean, she, she worked with all of these women who um, had, were in deep poverty because they had way too many children, and uh, a real recognition that, um, that that was the reason. And so birth control was really important to her, and she was arrested many, many, many times across the United States <laughs> um, and put in jail for trying to give out birth control to people. Yes, arrested and put in jail. Um, yes. I just read a, um, well, I mean, all, all of this is just so compelling. Um, I'm really go in any direction. I just wanted to share, I just finished reading a fabulous book. Um, it's, a, it's, it's fictional, but it's based on the story of um, a real character named Mabel Stark. And um, she was, um, she ultimately is known in the archives as a, the first um, woman tiger trainer. And, but she had this story that really speaks to um, what you're saying about there was, there was no room for her in the regular um, way, you know, she, she had a very troubled upbringing and um, was quite abused actually by her first husband and put in a sanatorium. And so the, it really speaks to, you know, these crazy treatments that were, so many women were being put in these sanatoriums because they were hysterical. And at the time, um, you know, incredibly horrendous unorthodox treatments, uh, you know, that was the beginning of shock treatment and even lobotomizing um, women. And in these sanatoriums where they would often be chained and so she went, she underwent shock treatment and um, hydrotherapy whereby she would be left in ice water in ice water for hours where she couldn't move. She actually was assisted by the physician and ran away, she was very young, joined the circus and survived and, and it's an extraordinary story because she was the first person, she, she, apparently she only stood a little bit over five foot tall. She was the first woman who, um, she, was, she was hired by Ringling and became famous, but she actually started gentling the animals, whereas the men at that time were using these, you know, awful, you know, whipping and really provoking the animals. She started a, the, one of the first movements of gentling the animals and, and treating them very, very well so that they would work with her. So I'm just saying, you know, it, it's like there's these amazing, extraordinary stories, and I just thought I would share a tiny bit of that one. Yes, thank <laughs> yeah, you. Thank you. Well, I'd like to uh, say that <clears throat> we just went through this election and uh, Hillary Clinton lost, but uh, it, it, it was amazing to watch the uh, diatribe against her uh, 
amplify all all of the things that were brought up by the, the Trump uh, campaign. Wow. And uh, it's probably going to mean that we won't see another woman running for president for quite a while. I mean, I mean, here she was probably one of the most astute politicians of her time, regardless of what you think of her uh, right. background. But uh, it, it, it was just amazing to see how that is still vibrant today, mm -hmm. those accusations against yes. women. Yeah. Here it is in 2017. That's right. So, I happen to listen to today's today's um, Sunday morning, Michael Enright, oh, Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if anybody's heard it yet. Yeah, yeah I've heard it. Yeah, but uh, he says Clinton wasn't the first woman. The first woman that ran for president was in the oh, 1800s. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's taken that long for another woman to run. Yeah. Wow. And he, um, he does agonizingly yeah. come yeah. to the conclusion that that That's she lost in spite of her extra three million votes she lost because she's a woman. Yeah. I, I hate to hear him say yeah. that, but that's what he's it's still there. Well, on that note, let's close on a better <laughs> note. <laughs> and in your order of service, you have uh, the song Red and Roses. And while it was written by a man, it was written as a result of all of the women's experience in the uh, textile mills in um, Massachusetts and New Hampshire. And um, the, the images ad hoc singers uh, changed a few of the words um, because they didn't really like some of what it said. Their mother's children, you know. And we mother them again, no. Uh, and so, uh, please everybody, maybe perhaps you could stand up and we could sing. Yeah. Uh, now, we have an ex uh, some, some people to sing along with over here who know how to carry the tune. And there's several women in the group who actually can do that too. Yes. Uh, okay, start, start at the beginning.
celebrations. May you all really enjoy the light and carry it in your hearts. And then we can blow out the candles. Now, are there any announcements? Yes, uh, I received an email from Mary Eaton and I think some of you will remember her. She mm -hmm. hasn't come too often, but she and her husband, Dale, came, and she uh, gave her, we sent a card to her yes. at the park, and, uh, and she said, uh, being with you all, such a short time was glorious. Love the card and the message so much. Enjoy the beautiful fawn we're going to have, Mary. And she and her husband, I think they went to mission. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Near Vancouver. Yeah. Maple Ridge. And Maple Ridge. also, I was, um, Michael Daly asked me to ask if any of you have uh, room to fill it one or two Unitarians from out of town and there who are coming to our belonging week weekend and uh, for this Friday, Saturday and Sunday evenings on October 20, 21st and 22nd. So if you can think about it and if you have room for these people, would you let me let myself know or Michael? Okay. Good. And, Any uh, other announcements? Oh, yeah, we're here. More? Yeah. Oh. yeah. Okay. Do you have more announcements? And, well, we'll be sending everyone uh, a copy of the invitation to come to the belonging ceremony. Great. We got one And a um, couple things going on this week. Wednesday at the courthouse at 5 o'clock is the. Um, Gathering for the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. And oh, Wednesday. Wednesday. So Wednesday, Wednesday in front of the courthouse. Five o'clock. Five o'clock. And Thursday um, is the fundraiser for victims of the Mexican earthquake. And you can buy tickets for 20 bucks at El Taco. And um, that's, I believe, at six. Let me check. Uh, it's at the Rod and Gun Club. And it is at 5.30. And it's dinner and dance. There's salsa lessons and all that. <laughs> <laughs> so, and El Taco's donating the dinner. So okay. yeah, 5.30 on Thursday and 5 o'clock on Wednesday. And I really want to thank Eva and Yana. Yes. 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 Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Marsha. And thanks to everyone. What a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Good. Yeah. All right. Have a great day. Yes. Okay. And I'd like to announce that we're having a drum circle here uh, tomorrow night at 6.30. So if you'd like to join us. Monday night? Yeah. Monday night. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, have a good week, everybody. Is there a potluck? Is there a potluck? Next week? What's next week? Oh, um, next week is Michael Daly uh, talking about belonging. Oh, that oh that's right. That's that's nice. Nice. Okay. Yeah. And that's Thanksgiving. And, and there's a potluck today, and we hope everybody will join us. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Very good. We're going to do our in the plane. Yeah. <laughs> Did you want to do our in the plane? Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. That one last detail. One last detail. That's all. Well, I'll hold your seat. Carrie.
carry the flame. You you sing. Carry, carry, carry the flame of peace and love until we meet again. Where's it going now? Oh, go now in peace. Go now in peace. peace. May the spirit of love surround you everywhere, everywhere you may go. Thank you for coming. So the setup for the potluck, which is put chairs around the tables. We've uh, we've got chairs on the on the, the back because there's another group coming. Okay.